Welcome, everybody. We are here today um, for a colloquium of Lindsay Blim. So Lindsay graduated from Chicago um, a while back, and then she moved for a postdoctoral position at the National Lab, where they realized she was too precious to let go. So they hired her. She's a physicist, a staff physicist over there. And since then, she got accomplishments. She got the DOE Early Career Award. And she's working primarily on S, uh, the South Pole telepos Telescope Galaxy Clusters. And today she's going to speak about that, but she knows any sort of things about galaxy clusters if you want to talk to her. Aside from her uh, scientific achievements, she's also very much engaged in the community. She was our boss of CMBS4. She was the chair of the governing board up until last year. Uh, she has done outreach uh, work, uh, equity and inclusion work, for which she also got other words. But I don't want to subtract more time to her talk. So I hope this introduction uh, is sufficient. <laughs> and here you go, Lindsay. Thanks, Elena, very much for that kind introduction. And thanks to the organizers um, for inviting me to share it with you today. Um, some of the new results we're getting from the South Pole Telescope. Um, shown, he whoop, shown here, uh, hang on, I can figure out how to use a laser pointer at this point, um, with the beautiful uh, southern lights in the background. So just to give you a brief introduction, I've been told and I see that there are many uh, people from many different fields here, um, not just uh, in the cluster workshop. So I thought I'd just tell you why I think it's such a great time um, to be a cosmologist, because we have these wonderful surveys um, from across the electromagnetic spectrum. And what we're really seeing is we probe down deeper and get ever more sensitive that you know we're really seeing a good level of agreement. So over and over in this talk, I'm going to show you these two uh, axes on plots. So this is omega matter, the density of matter in the universe, cold, dark matter, and baryonic matter. And this is a rescaled value of sigma eight, the amplitude of the matter power spectrum at redshift zero on eight megaparsec scales. But on the other hand, this plot makes it a little too simple. Perhaps we don't actually have concordance after all. We're seeing a lot of controversy depending on which surveys you look at. Of course, there's the famous h naught controversy where the Expansion of the universe has inferred from primary CMB measurements 13 billion years ago. Um, disagree at many sigma now with measurements from Cepheids and um, supernova for measuring the Hubble constant. But also depending on which growth of structure surveys you look at, um, you also see tensions in these parameters between sigma eight omega matter between what you measure primary CMB shown here. And then with, for example, galaxy clustering cosmic shear surveys. But even if it turns out we have concordance after all, you can write this pie chart down and say most of the universe is, yeah, dark matter. A bunch of it's dark energy. The majority of it is. What the heck are dark matter and dark energy? Even if we can put you know, firm error bounds on this pie chart, we still really don't know what these fundamental constituents of the universe are. There's lots of growth to come in the coming decades. In the area I've chosen to work in, uh, if you just turn the crank and ask what are the most sensitive cosmological probes, it turns out that these things called galaxy clusters um, could emerge as the most co powerful cosmological probe if we can actually measure the masses of these clusters through which we connect to theory. For those of you who aren't um, astronomers or cosmologists, I just wanted to define what a galaxy cluster was before we dive too deep into this talk. Um, these are the largest collapsed objects in the universe, um, and they have masses greater than about 10 to the 14 times the mass of the sun. The majority is dark matter, um, and about 10 to 15 percent is normal matter, of which a few percent is actually what makes up the galaxies, as you can see in this beautiful image here. There are three, oh, sorry. Um, to give you uh, just a viewpoint, sorry, is this echoing? Um, how clusters can really be so powerful for measuring cosmology, I just wanted to show these images from a simulation. This is now an older simulation, but I think it beautifully illustrates the point. Up here, we have a matter dominated universe with no dark energy. This is now just showing redshift or look back time um, for an Einstein to sitter universe. And as uh, time goes forward and redshift goes down, um, structure grows, gravitational collapse, you get more and more and more galaxy clusters, which are uh, illustrated by these little yellow circles here. If we look instead in a universe that looks very much like what we think the universe looks like today, we see an incredibly different picture as we look back in time. 
same universe existed at redshift zero, but as we look further and further back in a dark energy dominated universe, we see an incredibly different density of clusters. Clusters had to start forming effectively earlier in dark energy universe in order to reach the density we observe today. Now, this is not the only thing parts of the cosmological model that are um, affected by that affect cluster abundances. Um, you can look at the whole suite of parameters that we're interested in cosmology from dark energy, um, evolving dark energy, neutrino masses, just a whole spectrum of things. What you see, and this is done by a simulation done by a group at Argonne um, called the Mirror Titan Universe, which simulated over 100 different cosmologies um, models is that the abundance of clusters in this paper by Sebastian Bouquet et al, the function of mass here, so this is the sort of fundamental thing we're going after, it's highly sensitive to what your cosmological parameters are. Um, extremely sensitive on the high mass end. Um, and what we measure, it depends sensibly on the matter of power spectrum, the sigma eight parameter I showed you, growth of structure, and a little bit on the growth of, of the rate of expansion or each Z. Now, before I dive too much into the weeds, so what I might find wildflowers, you might find weeds. Just remember that everything I'm talking about for cluster cosmology is really connecting back to two things. In order to do clusters, cosmology with clusters, we first need to find them, and then we need to, quote, weigh them or connect them to mass, which is how we connect to all these beautiful theoretical models, which tell, can inform us about our cosmology. So there's historically, there's been three approaches. Clusters of galaxies get their name, obviously, from the huge overdensities of galaxies you see. So hundreds of thousands of galaxies localized in space. Um, there are also sources of bright extended X-ray emission. Um, and what I'll be talking about today and explaining it a bit more is we can actually detect these in what's called the Sinai Zeldovich effect in CMB surveys. Now, what the, the each, I've been told not to go too far. So, uh, the range of, uh, there's, distinct advantages to each one of these detection methods. Um, and what you can see here now is sort of the limiting mass, how well we're able to detect these 90% completeness of these surveys, the function of redshift for each of these different probes. Um, so for optical surveys, you can detect over densities of galaxies up to quite high redshift until you lose flux from these surveys. Um, X-ray surveys are cosmologically dim going into something like one plus C cubed. But then the SC surveys, as I'll explain, are really incredibly sensitive across all redshift ranges. We're really just limited currently by the instrumental noise in our data sets. Today, I'll be telling you about how we're combining data, two generations of SPT surveys, namely SPTSC and SPT poll with the dark energy to extract cosmological constraints. Now, the Sinai Zeldovich effect, or SC effect, or SZ effect, um, as you'll hear about for the rest of this talk, is really quite a simple physical phenomenon. So basically, towards a massive cluster, about 1% of the cosmic microwave photons, or CMB photons, will be inverse Compton scattered off the hot gas that has been shock heated to hundreds of million degrees Kelvins in these deep potential wells, and be upscattered in energy. We take our beautiful 2.73 Kelvin CMB black body spectrum, and we distort it in a known way. If you subtract these two curves from each other, um, the blue curve from the red curve, what you'll see at the locations of clusters about arc minute scales or 60th of degree on the sky is that you see a characteristic decrement where the photons were um, at the locations of clusters at low energies below 220 gigahertz, the SC null, and an increment above. Now this process is uh, very tightly coupled the cluster mass, the, the hot X-ray gas is essentially in hydrostat almost in hydrostatic equilibrium. And so if you look at the um, integrated signal, you should see Compton Y. You'll notice this familiar equation here. Um, it's proportional to the total thermal energy. It should be a very close proxy for cluster mass. Um, and this has been seen um, in numerous simulations as well as now observations. Just point you to this recent paper here by Florian Kazori, who can tell you about his work studying this here. Now, clusters are incredibly rare on the sky. These are the largest collapsed objects in the universe. In order to discover them, we really require high resolutions, things which are sensitive to arcment scale features on the sky, wide area surveys to discover significant numbers of clusters. And there's really been three players in this game um, for CMB surveys, um, the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, or ACT, Planck Space Satellite, and then the South Pole Telescope, or SBT. And while space-based telescopes have the advantage of no atmosphere, so you can go um, wide and straddle both above, above and below the SV decrement with many, many bands, 
on the ground, we're really limited in our atmospheric windows. So this is now just showing you the transmission from the atmosphere at the South Pole, world's largest desert, basically the base best place on Earth for millimeter weight of astronomy, followed by the Atacama Desert in Chile. And what you see for a typical um, 0.25 millimeter precipital water vapor in the atmosphere, we have these narrow windows where we can situate bands to observe the cosmic wave background. Fortunately, nature has given us a gift. The CMB peaks at 150 gigahertz right here. Um, so SBT observes in these three bands here, two in the SC decrement and one at the SC null. So the South Pole Telescope today, um, this is a 10 meter telescope about a kilometer from the geographic South Pole. I love this picture because I managed to sneak into many of the shots. So that's me there for scale. Um, and this 10 meter meter telescope um, with 20 micron circuits accuracy, gives you arc minute resolution on the sky. So our, our bands, our key workhorse at 150 gigahertz a 1.2 arc minute resolution. We've had three generations of, tele of cameras installed on SBT. I'll really be focusing for the majority of this talk on results we're deriving from the first two generations, SBTSE and SBT poll. And I'm very excited and I'll show some preliminary results from the SBT 3G survey at the end of the talk. Now, of course, this isn't my own work. Um, well, some of this is my own work, but this is not just my own work. Um, this is the work of a large group of people. Here we are smiling um, at our most recent collaboration meeting in Chicago this summer. So SPT has about 80 grad students, postdocs, and faculty um, working to analyze this wonderful data coming off the telescope. So let me give you a flavor of what our data looks like. Um, to orient you, this is now, of course, Planck um, over the whole sky. Now imagine you're at the center of this globe. And then you zoom in on a 50 degree patch. So about a seven by seven patch to the sky. SBT has observed much more than this, but I just want to show you where the angular resolution benefits you get from having a 10 meter telescope on the ground um, really buys you. So this is an image of the area in Planck at 143 gigahertz. Huge upgrade over WMAP, really uh, sharpened our view of our cosmological model. Um, but then now this is just the first generation of SBT over the same 50 square degrees. So six and a half times minor angular resolution than Planck, and about two and a half times deeper. If I high pass this filter to really accentuate small scale features in this map, what you'll see, is you'll see, of course, residual CMB, CMB anisotropies, both primary and secondaries. Um, you also see these point sources. So these are typically AGN or blaze stars, um, but we also sometimes see the most distant star forming galaxies in the universe, which by chance gravitationally lensed um, and highly magnified. Thing which I work on, which I'm most excited about, are instead these shadows. This is now what a cluster of galaxies looks like in the CMB sky, these decrements here. So not just 50 square degrees, as I mentioned, but over the course of our first two generation cameras, we've observed over 5,000 square degrees with the South Pole Telescope. So to orient you, this is background here is the IRAS dust map. So of course, the CMB experiment wants to observe the least dusty patches of the sky, not the galaxy. Um, and over here, this Starship Enterprise shaped thing, um, this is the dark energy survey. So a wonderful optical survey, which has a lot of complementary um, data we use in SC analyses. On the three SBT surveys I'll be talking about here, SBTSC, 500 square degree SBT pole survey, and then this blue shaded uh, blue dash region, which is SBT extended cluster survey. How do we find clusters in SC surveys? Um, this is a technique that's actually really standard across um, physics and electrical engineering. I've talked to people who do signals processing and they're like, oh yeah, we do this to analyze our data in engineering too. Um, but basically what we do is this is now moving to Fourier space instead of real space. So to orient you, um, this is amplitude of the power spectrum versus multipole. Um, I love a hun a hundred is about a degree scale and thousands about arc minute scales. Um, we optimize our Fourier space filters, which we hit our maps with, maximize the signal to noise of cluster scaled features. So our noise in this case looks like primary CMB, as well as foregrounds um, and other signals in the sky, such as those radio sources in the cosmic infrared background. Um, our signal is a cluster profile, so the clusters have a typical shape um, on our no profile or a beta profile. And when you combine these two together, you get an optimal weighted combination in Fourier space which you can then use to combine the different frequency maps to pull out your detection. First blind detection of this in CMB data really took the development of these wide field um, 
mini bolometer cameras um, to have the sensitivity to detect the cluster signals. So the first detection actually took place about 15 years ago. Um, this I love this picture, especially this row here, because it shows you what the match filter does. This is now 150 gigahertz, um, just the raw CMB sky with minimal filtering. Note the scale here. So this is fluctuations of 200 micro K on the 2.73 Kelvin black body. And when you filter the map, what you see is you see at 150 and 90, you see this characteristic decrement. And then at 220, you do see the null. So this is a signal of an SC cluster in the CMB sky. Now, of course, since then, we've made huge amounts of progress. From these first four detections back in 2008, there are now thousands of massive galaxy clusters that have been detected and published from CMB surveys. So the next step after finding these guys they're redshift independent. I can't tell you what redshift this decrement is at the sky. We have to follow them up. And to do that, let's see if I point the right way. We've used on the South Pole Telescope really a multi-facility campaign for cluster characterization and for confirmation, for finding the galaxy over densities that allow us to put a redshift on these cluster signals. Um, this is combined data from particularly the Blanco Telescope, which ran the Dark Energy Survey, um, the six and a half meter Twin Magellan Telescopes, Hubble Space Telescope, I'll come to in a minute for um, calibration of our signals, and Spitzer for confirming the highest redshift of our clusters. Now to do this, what we do, we go to the location where we know in the sky, we, we, we can pinpoint in the sky where that SC detection is. And this is a tool we're using for our most recent analysis developed by Matthias Klein at Munich um, called the Multi-Component Match Filter. So we scan along the sky using the optical galaxies, looking for the over densities of galaxies, which would pinpoint where in um, redshift the galaxy clusters would live. Galaxy clusters have a characteristic population, which is very red and dead, as we call it. So their colors of galaxy clusters um, are pretty determinate for the redshift following the red sequence. Um, and then we can scan through this redshift and count the number of galaxies, the given redshift, to identify the peaks that correspond to our clusters. We can also do this along many random lines of sight to identify the possibility of chance counterparts, which is very important when you want to do a cosmological analysis. Higher redshifts, um, where we move beyond the reach of the um, ground-based of the, um, the optical surveys, we instead leverage what's called the 1.6 micron stellar bomb feature, with a similar thing. So this is a single color photo Z where we've done some tricks to remove the lower redshift galaxies, but you can scan along in redshift space and count over densities of galaxies to obtain the redshift. Um, unfortunately, this really peaks it out at redshift 1.6. Um, we, we lose there's this degenerate with redshift and color, but we can say that we've detected these guys, you know, 10 billion years in the past or later is what that redshift roughly corresponds to. And I should mention that this technique here is also going to be the one of the fundamental ways that SPARIX, for example, NASA's MIDEX mission, um, measures galaxy redshifts. So here's just some pictures of some brand new, really high redshift clusters um, we discovered with a South Pole telescope and their Spitzer data. And one of the really exciting things, I know there's JWST people here, um, is we're really starting to see the evolution of star formation in clusters, even at this massive end. So some of these clusters, you actually see a blue spider web thing, the optical and no signal from the red, which really pops when you um, include the Spitzer data. So we're really tracing the evolution of clusters, which is exciting. So this is our most recent result here, um, showing now the mass of the clusters we've detected with the South Pole Telescope versus their redshift. So this paper will be out um, later this month, or early in October. Um, and this is our third generation. This is the final sample from what's called the 500 square degree uh, SPT survey. Um, and what we found is over 544 of these are confirmed as galaxy clusters. You can see this really nice, um, well-defined feature as a function of mass and redshift, which illustrates SC selection. So clusters at higher redshifts for a fixed over density or definition of mass are hotter, makes their SC signal a little brighter. Um, but then going a little into the weeds, for ground-based instruments, on larger scales, because of residual atmosphere, our noise is also a little higher. So we're actually more sensitive to slightly smaller things in the data, which forms this characteristic trace. So again, we're probing really high redshift for clusters. Um, and over 20% of our sample is above redshift one. But this is really a cheat here, this axis. Um, and Gus will frown at me for even writing mass. Um, this goes through a relationship for how we assign mass to our SC signals. Um, and I really want to give you an explanation of how we do this. So the first thing you should know is that 
we've done three different generations of SVT surveys. The noise varies by a factor of seven. So our deepest survey has reached five micro Kelvin on an arc minute scales. And our shallowest survey is more like plonk depth, around uh, 30 to 35 micro K arc minute. But we want to relatively calibrate all of our surveys and our signals to put them on a common scale to do them for cosmology. To do this, we use um, mock simulations of the CMB sky. So we take a light cone um, from the hack outer rim and body simulation, post process and add SC signals to this data. Um, and then we add instrumental noise. So CMB data is not like an optical camera. We have imaged the 500 square degree field 4,700 times over four years to make that map I showed you. It's really easy for us to mock up what noise in our data looks like just by randomly assigning pluses and minuses to our data, adding it and making noise maps. Um, so these are the realized instrumental noise performance. We can add models for the cosmic microwave background and the cosmic infrared background and radio sources to make a mock sky and run it through our entire cluster finding machinery um, to do relative calibration based on different levels of instrumental noise. When we do that, what we find for these three generations of surveys, uh, rescaling our what we call our signal to noise is our observable um, by the simulation calibration factor. Let me just walk you through this line here. Um, so this is now taking our signal to noise, which is what we use with our cluster observable. Every cluster has a signal to noise. It's the cleanest thing to detect when you smooth everything with an arc minute beam on the sky. Um, and we debias it because there's three degrees of freedom in our cluster search to RA and DEC and cluster size. And then you can relate this debias signal to noise or zeta to mass through a typical scaling relation. So it has an amplitude a mass slope and a redshift normalization or a redshift evolution parameter. And what we find um, using the simulation calibration is excellent consistency between the factor of six and noise, um, between the, the normalization, the slope, and then a predicted shift in the redshift evolution parameter because the actual shape, and this is going a little into the weeds, sorry, of that match filter really changes based on the level of instrumental noise to astrophysical foregrounds. Now, the other thing we're worrying about as we go to lower mass with these SC surveys, is actually contamination from the galaxies themselves. So as a cosmologist, I just wish these were spherical cows, and then I could just find them and have a simple connection to mass to do my theoretical, uh, my cosmological model constraints. Unfortunately, galaxies are, can get in the way. So we're measuring the gas, um, but of course there are galaxies, hundreds of thousands of them, that live in these clusters that can actually emit at millimeter wavelengths. And so this is something that as we go down in mass, um, these signals get more and more important to characterize. At low frequency, you can have synchrotron radiation, um, which falls as alpha minus 0.7 or minus 0.1. Um, whereas at high frequencies coming in from the other end, you could have a uh, correlated emission from star forming galaxies that actually could live in your clusters. So with this new data, we've actually been able to test for this internal to our data set. Um, because we've now reached depths where we can independently run the cluster finder using only our 90 gigahertz data or only our 150 gigahertz data. What I'm showing here is comparisons for clusters, just running the whole machinery, the simulation calibration forward, measure the mass of the systems. And what you see is that this is 150, this is 90. We have excellent agreement between the two. Um, where we have external information, such as from SUMS radio survey, where we might expect some synchrotron contamination, can see that. So the 150 will be higher than the 90, which you would expect. Um, and we see maybe the slightest hint, about one and a half sigma above redshift one, that the star formation rate might be picking up in the cluster. So maybe a three and a half percent bias to our masses, but that's at a small significance level. Um, we do find fun things like this guy is about a six sigma outlier. Turns out this galaxy here where the 90 mass is much higher than the 150, that's real. This is a galaxy cluster that is strongly lensing a distant star forming galaxy. Um, that flux from that distance are from galaxy is then filling in the 90 gigahertz uh, signal more than the 150, gig uh, 150 gigahertz signal more than the 90. Okay, so I've told you about doing this with our fixed cosmology um, using as relative calibration from simulations, but we don't want to fix cosmology. We actually want to constrain cosmology with these clusters. So the key other aspect of clusters besides finding them weighing them or connecting the masses of the objects, whether we're observing galaxy counts, whether they're observing X-ray luminosity or SC decrements to mass. The approach that we have adopted, the SC, uh, SPT calibration, which is now pretty standard in the field, is using what's called weak lensing mass calibration. So this is using the fact that uh, 
mass along the line of sight, um, because of general relativity, will, of course, shear background galaxies. The signal of the shearing, the distorting, and changing the ellipticity of background galaxies is directly linked to the projected mass distribution along the line of sight. Now, it's called weak gravitational lensing because the signal is too weak to be measured for a single galaxy, but of course can be measured statistically for an ensemble of galaxies. And what this would look like if you had infinite high signal to noise around a cluster is this. So this is a simulated um, ellipticity distortion field or shape distortion field around a mass cluster from an n-body simulation. And you can see that mass, the ellipticity curves in these uh, characteristic patterns around the mass along the line of sight. Whoa, sorry. I have no idea what just happened. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay, so to do this with our surveys, we've adopted a two-pronged approach. So this is really leveraging that wonderful 3,700 degrees of overlap we have with that dark energy survey. Because the Dark Energy Survey, through really a heroic effort, just was an army of people, has made beautiful sheer calibrations of all the galaxies and the bright galaxies in their surveys, relatively bright galaxies. But they've also measured the photometric redshift, so you know where behind your cluster they are. These are the two key components for weak gravitational lensing. 700 of the 1,000 clusters in this analysis I'm about to show you do have measurements of shear um, with the Dark Energy Survey. And so that's shown here. This is now stacked. Um, for visualization purposes. In the actual analysis, this is done on a very noisy cluster basis um, to get more accuracy and retain the individual information we have for each cluster. You can see it's extremely high signal to noise, over signal to noise 80 um, for this mass calibration tool. Now, how we calibrate um, the simulation, the shear profile to actually connect our measurements to mass was explained in this really nice paper by Sebastian Scrandi. Okay, and Joe Moore here in the audience um, in this paper that was published here. And this is a simulation-based uh, calibration where you take clusters from hydrodynamic simulations, you mock up shear calibration, you measure them exactly in the simulation as you would in real data, and back out what sort of biases you might observe and how to directly compare your shear observable to the mass we can construct for the cluster. Now, above redshift 0.7, 0.8 or so, DES really runs out of steam. We're really looking forward to Rubin and Euclid to push to higher redshifts from these wide field surveys. But at higher redshift, um, we've actually made extensive use of data from the Hubble Space Telescope. So this is work by, by Tim Schraubach and his group in Innsbruck, um, where they've taken uh, pointed, many pointed observations with the Hubble Space Telescope to do similar calibrations on the high redshift systems. Different challenges, less bands, different resolutions, smaller field of view, um, but um, really, really great work thrown out in these papers to explain how you would actually do this calibration for these systems. Now, to run this through a cosmological analysis, to actually get the results we're after, we use our standard Monte Carlo Markov chain techniques where now we're simultaneously varying cosmology, these cosmological parameters here. So our baseline model, we do the six lambda CDM parameters and we add neutrino mass because we neutri know neutrinos must have mass. But at the same time, we go back to the scaling relation parameters I showed you, the mass, the normalization, the redshift evolution, scatter between mass and our observable, but also correlated scatter because now we're folding in not just the SC, um, and the weak lensing halo mass, but also those galaxy information about the galaxies used to detect the clusters to deal with the chance of chance alignments along the line of sight. These are all folded in and calibrated for the three tomographic weak lensing bins we use from DES to produce our cosmological results. Now, there's an important thing that when you're going to test cosmology, we all have priors. We've all seen the Planck results. Um, you want to make sure that your choices when you do all these complicated steps, when you choose what galaxies to use, when you choose what radial bins to use for weak lensing, how much you want to excise around, for example, the center of the cluster. Um, you want to make sure that these choices do not directly map in your head to changes in your cosmological parameters. So what we've done is we blinded our shear sample, multiplied by you know a huge random number, um, and then run our cosmological chains, split our sample, and look for changes in these blinded cosmological parameters and scaling relation parameters based on places we think there might be systematics in the cluster data. So for example, 
Um, if you are worried about the low red, the full sample was shown here. So this is going from redshift 0 0.25 to 1.8 with these various signal to noise cuts, which mapping into the different depths of the surveys from deepest to shallowest go to about 90% um, purity intrinsically in the SC before follow-up. So that's why there's a changing um, signal to noise threshold here. But if you now split this and say, here's the results for our full sample, well, maybe we're getting a little scared about redshift one. You know, the, we know the CIB, we know there can be contamination. What changes, we know that this is where the Hubble Space Telescope weak lensing calibration comes in. What if we cut there? How does that change for results from our fiducial sample? Um, similarly changing, um, signal to noise threshold, so a much higher intrinsic SC purity if you're worried about the optical um, quantification of false contamination. In DES lensing, there's lots of really subtle, tricky systematics you might worry about. Um, the simplest one to say is, how much of the core do you want to excise around the cluster? Because maybe where you think you're centering in simulations is not actually where you're centering in the data. It's hard to define the center of a halo, um, observationally match it to simulations. Um, and what we're finding is really excellent agreement amongst all these splits, which is really giving us confidence before we unblinded. That we were um, robust to these systematics, which were all marginalized over um, in the, 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 the systematics we knew about we marginalized over in the analysis. And this is now just showing um, our best fit model from the blind analysis compared to our observables. Um, and what I think I'm really impressed with this actually, um, is that this is now the number counts of clusters versus redshift. This is the prediction uh, from the data and from the, the recovered model. This is now the signal to noise distribution. So massive clusters, of course, much more higher signal to noise, very steep uh, function, um, matches really well. Similarly for the counts and galaxy counts and richness. And then this last panel here is modeling the shear. So predicting from the model what the shear profile should look like for all of our clusters. Now, this is the first look at the unblinded results. We just unblinded these recently. And to me, this is incredibly exciting. So this is work led by Sebastian Bouquet with these folks here. Um, definitely talk to Joe, um, who's sitting here in the audience so well about this. Um, but this is now going back to those fundamental parameters I told you about earlier. So sigma eight, RMS matter uh, fluctuations of matter power, spectrum eight micro parsec scales versus omega matter, um, the density of matter. What we're showing on the left here are results from Planck. So Planck is here. This is now for new CDM. So those of you used to looking at Planck are using to look a little tighter, but this is opening it up so that the masses of neutrinos are included in the cosmological fits. Um, this is now our results, um, the growth of structure over 13 billion years, not just in, uh, showing that we have wonderful consistency primary CMB from Planck. Um, growth of structure tests, really powerful on um, cross-check on Planck CMB. Um, these are now showing from ACT and SPT poll, actually weak gravitational lensing of the cosmic microwave background. Um, a little bit less constraining, but in the same region, and we'll get much better um, as we move to Simon's Observatory, SPT 3G, and CMBS4 in the future. And finally here, um, this is where some of the tension lies between the two cosmic shear surveys from the Dark Energy Survey. Um, and from KITS plus um, BAO from BOSS um, down here. So those are pulling a little bit away um, from primary CMB and clusters. Um, but all generally in a good agreement. And we the nice thing is we're really going to get fantastic new results on each of these over the coming decade with the new surveys coming online. Um, similarly, if you compare to cluster surveys, um, we're shown here. Um, previous work um, led by Steve Allen, who's also here, definitely talked to him about the x-ray surveys from Wang the Giants, from EFEDs and HSC weak lensing. Um, the optical surveys tend to have different systematics, so it can pull away, but generally great consistency between the ICM selected clusters and their cosmological results. So it's really encouraging that different teams with different blinding techniques and different analyses using different weak lensing are all ending up roughly in the same um, ballpark. Okay, so... In my abstract, I promised you that I would not only talk about lambda, uh, about how we can also not only just use these to constrain evolution of the universe, but also to test dark matter models. And so we do this not through the number counts of cosmology I told you about before, but actually through a different probe you can do with clusters called strong lensing science. So it's strong lensing, unlike weak gravitational lensing, where you have to do it statistically, strong lensing, if you guys have seen the beautiful JWST images, is the really the multiple images of background sources from this um, well, strong lensing regime. Um, and it's a direct test of, it can be used for a direct test of structure formation. 
because large n-body simulations provide direct predictions for the properties of dark matter halos that we can directly test at the cores of these massive systems using strong gravitational lensing. For individual clusters, if you want to do detailed mass modeling, joint strong and weak lensing can provide the best constraints. And finally, if you're really interested in the earliest universe, um, strong lensing is really a powerful cosmic telescope because it can highly magnify background galaxies, really letting us probe to the earliest areas, reionization, um, with time delays because the path light of a uh, background galaxy doesn't reach us all at the same time if it takes multiple paths through the clusters. You can do things like expansion rate universe. And then in a really cool thing, which is worth its own colloquium, and I'll just point at and say you should Google this, um, you can do really cool substruct matter substructure studies with um, strongly lens galaxies, um, such as combined analyses of SPT and ALMA. And I should just mention here, this is a fundamental prediction from n-body simulations. This is now showing the mass versus what's called the concentration. I have the equation in a couple of slides, but this is just basically governing the shape of the dark matter halos. And this is now predictions from the outer rim, this 4GPC n-body uh, cube box size uh, n-body simulation compared to uh, cluster measurements from the CLASH sample, which was HST, um, the Numenol, and then the X-rays from the Clenidol. Now we wanted to do this with the self telescope. So one of the problems with strong lensing studies is people find amazing strong lenses across the sky as with everything with cosmology and analysis of populations, you really have to understand what you found. You really have to understand your selection function. So our goal here was to take the entire SPT sample for which we understand its selection extremely well. We have a uniform SC selection. We wanted to obtain uniform imaging of the entire sample to, under to identify the strong lenses. So we followed up all the high significance clusters um, through an imaging program with what's called PSCO. PSCO is a really fun camera that's installed on the uh, clay telescope at Magellan. And what makes it fantastic is it has a five by arc minute field of view. Uh, Tony Stark at CFA is the PI, but it's a simultaneous Grizz imager. So it's got dichroics in there. So you image in all four filters at once these four bands. Um, so it can be extremely fast for follow-up of a uh, small field up of uh, small fields. Um, we adopted an adaptive exposure strategy where we compensated for air mass, seeing lunar brightness, um, and had a fast cadence. So given the RA range of SPT clusters from 22 hours to six hours, we're really able to optimize over the course of an observing night, the change in uh, altitude of the telescope, which affects its um, mirror form formations to really speed up how fast you can actually scan. Um, and we were able to observe over 120 clusters at a good night. So I would just advertise that for things like LSST, if you want to follow up transients or other objects, this could be a real workhorse um, in the future. Um, in parallel with this imaging campaign and efforts led by Karen Sharon and Juan Remolina Gonzalez at Michigan, we had a spectroscopic campaign targeting the lens galaxies we found. And we followed up over 100 strong lensing systems. Um, and this is just a small snapshot of clusters. We, like I said, we observed the massive clusters in SVT, over 450 clusters observed with PSCO in better than nine arc seconds seeing. And really the results we found on this program were so exciting. It motivated a large HST SNAP program, um, PI'd by Mike Gladders at UChicago. We actually obtained an additional 130 cluster SNAPs, two band SNAPs with the Hubble Space Telescope to add to our weak lensing. Um, observations. So we have over 200 clusters with HST imaging for SPT to search for strong lenses. Now to connect all of this uh, wonderful data with the actual predictions we want to make with simulations to tie the two together, um, at Argonne, uh, working with Mike Ladders, we built this program to mock up um, cluster scale strong lensing using the outputs of n-body simulations. This was work led by Nan Lee when he was a postdoc at Argonne. And I'm not gonna wait for the answer here, but I'll just say one of these is a real cluster with real strong lensing and the other is a simulated image. So think to yourself which one you think it might be. But with this program, um, using, like I mentioned, the outer rim, moving in the future to these wonderful new hydro sims that are being run at Argonne, um, we can predict the redshift distribution and other high order statistics for strong lensing. Um, we would expect 
We expect there to be over 100 strong lenses to be identifiable in this sample we followed up, which is actually matching with the truth. That paper will be coming out this fall. Um, and one of our key objectives is actually measure the mean mass concentration relation of this halo to directly test against the predictions from these cosmological simulations. Now, for many of our clusters, the data is actually pretty sparse. So we, we aren't frontier fields or clash. Um, we actually generally have very minimal strong lensing information. So we'll have an image, we'll have an Einstein radius because you can measure the arc and you can measure the Einstein radius. Um, but we really wanted to know, given this limited amount of information, what's the best way to pull out robust mass information from these clusters? So this was really the PhD work of Juan Remolina Gonzalez. Um, and what he did was he took these ray trace strong lensing images from the outer rim, measured what we would do in observation. So he would say, this is the uh, the radius I'm gonna use for the Einstein radius of these clusters. What is the mass enclosed? Go directly to the gravitational simulation, um, measure the mass enclosed um, for 74 systems at high mass. So like the SVT mass with many realizations per halo based on halo rotation and other things. Um, and this is what he found found that it's actually a pretty good measure, which has been known but not quantified before, of the mass in the inner regions of clusters. There's a spite bias, um, which you can correct for, but it actually has about a 5% scatter. Um, this very simple observable actually has a 5% scatter with the mass in this region of the cluster. So when you can do that, you can now measure the mass concentration relation for a strong lensing sample of clusters. So this is the, the famous NFW profile here. So this is the density of dark matter as a function of radius. Um, there's this particular parameter here, excuse me, called the concentration, which is just related to say R delta of R500 over the scale radius here. So if you take clusters, which were strong lenses, so matching the selection function from the simulation, you measure their concentration, and you do the exact same thing on this SPT sample, what you find is shown here. So we're finding excellent agreement. Um, this is actually the line from the simulations, I believe. Um, this work will be out this fall. So we're still tweaking the last things with error bars. So I don't want to quote exact statistics, um, but really excellent agreement where you can measure the normalization, the slope, bit limited in the redshift evolution at this point. But again, this was for a small sample of clusters. What we're really looking forward to is this test, but now on the SC surveys to come from SPT3G, from Simon's Observatory, with Rubin imaging, it's going to make the sample increase by one order of magnitude in the next few years. Okay, so that's the results from the first two generations of surveys. Let me tell you what we're up to in Antarctica right now, because we've been busy down there too. Um, and that's with our third generation, our 15,000 detectors on sky with SPT3G. So with SPT3G, we're actually in the midst of a 10,000 square degree survey of the southern sky. So the galaxy here actually flipped over. So this is now dark energy survey. <laughs> Excuse me. And where we're at is we're really achieving phenomenal depth in a deep patch. So this 1500 square degree actually is coordinated to overlap with the bicep experiments. We're going to use CMB lensing from SPT3G, D-Lens, for those of you familiar with the term, the bicep data, to get better constraints on the tensor to scale or ratio R in that region. But we've also been surveying, just like we did with SPT-ECS, this wider patch here when the sun contaminates our main field in the cell phone. Um, this is now reaching depths about eight to nine micro k arc minute. Um, and then our wide field, SPT3G, the next 6,000 square degrees is scheduled to be surveyed next year and we'll cover these regions. To put this in a little bit of context, for you, those of you who don't think micro k arc minute, um, I just wanted to compare it to the depth versus number of modes. So this is basically area divided by the resolution of the telescopes um, for current um, and upcoming experiments, um, particularly the 9150-220 channels, 9150-220, that's how these points are weighed. This main deep survey here is actually reaching the depths of the final CMBS4 wide survey depth today. Um, for our wider summer field surveys, this external 10K, we will be reaching SO depths um, in 2024. Um, and then BICEP, of course, is doing excellent, but we have much more to go to get to CMBS4 um, for primordial beamlet. Um, as our program manager loves, we are in what we call regular routine operations. Um, we've really achieved no nominal operating efficiency and sensitivity. Um, 
over the years. So this is just showing our on-field of sensitivity. I think most interesting down here is just versus time, we are integrating down as expected. So we are reaching the targeted depths um, to do all this fantastic science. Um, we get to plonk depths on a 1500 square degree field every week. And we're observing this 1500 square degree field every two days for six years, except for when we're doing the wide field and the summer field survey. So if you love transient science, it's not in this talk, we've observed this thousands of times. So we're seeing stellar flares, we're seeing AGN. There's a lot of really cool transient science happening in these patches. Um, this is what a small patch of that field looks like. So much, much deeper. I mean, you can pick out the galaxy clusters by eye, um, similarly the AGN and dusty sources. So we're working hard on the first catalog of clusters to be deduced from this data. Um, at 99% purity, where you don't even have to follow it up, we've already detected over 24, uh, about 2,500 2, galaxy cluster candidates and pushing down to lower signal to noise, um, about 6,000. Um, the candidates are screened through the dark energy survey. Um, push higher than DES camera right now. We've been using the Magellan 4 star infrared camera. Really, really looking forward to Euclid, which will allow us to confirm clusters out to redshift of two. Um, if you look at the preliminary um, screening with DES, um, this is now a plot that Florian made, um, did analysis of. Um, so this is Eli Rykoff ran targeted red mapper for us at the locations of the SPT candidates. This is now the mass redshift distribution for SPT 3G. So really pushing down in sensitivity. Um, out to high redshift. We've recently had a bunch of SPT uh, 3G signs, including a paper that showed up on the archive last week. So this is just on the first set of data. So four months, um, 1,500 square degrees, already basically surpassing SPT poll and sensitivity. So the earlier results I showed you. Um, and what's interesting when you do these analyses is we're weighing in, but we're not really resolving things like the H naught tension between CMB and local probes. So it's going to be really interesting not to look at just the first four month, first months of data, but to move on into full four to six year analyses. Um, the first uh, two years we expect to be coming out this spring. Um, as far as clusters in the future, this is now just showing you the number of clusters versus redshift. This is where we are today. Uh, Matt Hilton's here. You should definitely go talk to him about the ACT catalog. It is fantastic, over 13,000 square degrees of sky. Um, what's going to be coming from the deep field and then the, the full field is going to really push out here. Now, whether there's really clusters we're going to detect out here depends on whether the gas is virialized out to redshift three. But I think the really cool thing is we'll be learning out to, about cluster formation out to these highest redshifts. Um, the cosmology is going to be fantastic. We're really going to be competitive with primary CMB. So this is now a much smaller contour plot showing you where we will be compared to Planck. And uh, let me just end approximately on time and just say that um, we found over the last 15 years, thousands of clusters reaching out to high redshift via the SPT SC effect. Um, the sample has really led to fantastic studies for cosmological and astrophysical studies, which I gave really short shrift to in this talk. Um, Clusters from the first two generations of SBT surveys, so about a thousand clusters combined with optical weak lensing data from HST and DS, I think are really po providing powerful tests of LANA CDM, growth of structure probes. Um, and we're really finding that these results are consistent so far, those have inferred from primary CMB. And the next few years are gonna be really exciting. I'm, I'm super psyched about these. Um, we're in the midst of our 10,000 square degree of survey of the Southern sky and the progress on the analysis of this is well underway. Thanks. One related to the concentration mass relation, uh, it's it true that there is a strong intrinsic uh, scalpter, but uh, there is also a slight dependence on the cosmological parameter. So I'm wondering if you try to to see, uh, to try to characterize it, to put constraint on omega matters it made also using this information. The second question is related to the same dimension. I saw that apparently, apparently you have signal, so I was wondering if you are able to put or stack the beans uh, some constraint of the mass as well and uh, try to implement a sort of self-consistent calibration with your data. Okay, yes. So I was asked to repeat the questions for Zoom. So the first question was 
there is a cosmological dependence for the CM relation. Have we explored uh, testing for omega matter um, sigma eight dependencies in this? And I will say the answer thus far is no. Um, we have not um, gone that far. We're, we've been focusing at this fixed cosmology thus far. Um, I think that would be definitely an interesting extension in the future. So I would worry that it might not be so great. <laughs> I, th I think you'd be better to put priors on from either the cluster analyses or from Planck CMP and fold that into um, the analysis. Um, the second question was about gravitational lensing. So in principle, um, with next generation, like SPT 3G, SO, CMBS4, you don't actually have to use the optical weak lensing surveys. The weak lensing of the cosmic microwave background itself can provide a mass calibration constraint. Um, so these are just two forecasts um, made by Srini Raghunathan for just the 1500 square degree patch to start. Um, though the lensing goes sort of as noise to the fourth. Um, and so it's it will be less uh, sensitive in the, the wider fields. Um, and this is what you get. So if you did stack the clusters, you would get about a 30 sigma detection of CMB lensing. Um, Prakrit Shabal actually took the initial analysis of SPTSC and folded it through our cosmological pipeline. Um, this was very shallow data, so it was only about a five sigma overall mass calibration. But yes, absolutely. The plan is to fold in the CMB lensing to do an independent test. Um, it's not going to be as sensitive as the optical surveys, but it will have different, some some of the systematics will be uncorrelated for sure. Uh, uh, could, could you explain, is, is uh, SPD3G expected to outperform SO for high ratio clusters? Yes, um, that comes from two things. So the mass sensitivity, so SO will not be, this is for SO baseline, I should be clear. SO wide will be deeper. Um, we didn't have the, the curves, weren't uh, published for that. But the, yes, so going to lower mass, uh, lower noise levels really lets us push down the sensitivity um, to lower mass cluster. So you get a lot that way, but then folding out to 10,000 square degrees also gets you a lot of volume. Um, so you can see that if you just stuck with the main 1500 square degree, you win at low mass high redshift because um, clusters had to have time to grow. So there is a you know, mass dependency on where you can actually detect them. But then the wide field actually allows us to exceed over the whole range. No, I'm, I'm very excited about this sample. Uh, and I should say that was a question for people on Zoom about the number density of clusters as a function of redshift between SBT, 3G, and SO. Uh, Okay. Um. So this. Okay. So this is actually pretty simple to explain. So this and this plot represents a sharp cut in signal to noise. So that's what a sharp cut in signal to noise looks like. Uh. Sorry. The question on Zoom was why is why does the mass redshift plot for SPT look like it does? So, first of all, the noise in the SBT, um, there's two components which really drive this. The first is the noise in the SBT maps. So if I go back to this figure here, which is a figure of the match filter. Um, so the instrumental noise at SBT is really white. Um, this is, pretend this was CL, not DL. Um, is really white, so just um, above L of 3000. So it would be flat. Now below, of, below L of 3000, um, we have residual one over F noise from the atmosphere. And so the noise curves up like this. We also have a really bright CMB there. <laughs> and so the two combination really changes your effective noise to a function of angular scale. High redshift clusters are smaller in the sky, smaller angular scales. That makes us more sensitive to high redshift clusters than very low redshift clusters. That's thing one. Two is for a fixed mass over density. So M500, for example, um, rho crit. Um, clusters are hotter at a higher redshift, and so they're brighter in the SC. So those two together give you this sort of characteristic built in your mass redshift curve. And notice on your um, automatic cell plus telescope uh, efficiency that it's mm -hmm. sort of peaking out around 60%. And I wonder, is there anything, what drives that? Could, it, could you actually gain a factor of 1.5 in the time? No, this is this is actually extremely efficient for a CMB telescope. We have to cycle our fridge. Um, so sorry, wheat. Um, the South Pole telescope detectors operate at 300 millikelvin above absolute zero. We use a closed cycle helium three helium four absorption fridge, and you have to cycle it so you can recool 
um, and get down to these base temperatures. So that takes time. That's definitely a hit in some of our observing efficiency. The other thing we do is we do regular on-sky calibrations of astronomical sources like RCW38. We tip the telescope to measure the relative response of the bolometers at different air masses to do that sort of calibration. So those calibrations really take time. So there's not a huge amount of efficiency to be gained from here. In principle, I mean, so ACT is using a different fridge technology where they can continuously cycle. That will buy you back a little technology and that can be a little bit touchy. So th there's benefits and trade-offs for that, but not a huge amount to be gained. Yeah. So, so you can measure like transients, right? So I'm wondering up to what ratio you can measure like so the low ones? Like so we haven't, so there's a really great paper I would refer you to on the archive about the first transient detections with SPT3G by guns at all. Um, and we haven't seen supernovae. Um, we've seen what seems to be flaring stars. There's a paper by Chris Tandoy from UIUC coming out soon on these. Um, we've seen AGN, definitely a bunch of AGN. Um, but we haven't seen supernovae. I think they'd have to be pretty close. This is something actually that people for the upcoming CMBS4 science book, like ACT and SPT are really realizing the transient potential here. Um, so there's really a lot of new explorations going on. People are thinking about off-axis GRBs, you know, what, what other cool things might show up in the millimeter wave? We've seen asteroids. We do track asteroids, so they're not quite a transient. Um, but uh, I think things like doing the forecast for supernovae um, is something that will be very interesting and um, would be even more accessible with things like CMBS4. Uh, Gus? You've been great workhorse along with ACT, as you say, uh, but most of it's been improved sensitivity at sort of that fixed one arc mean and angular resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts about improving angular resolution, particularly because it's, as you go to high redshift, you might think that the hot gas will still be there, it should be there, but there also may be some more point source contamination coming in at those redshifts, which higher angular resolution might help you with. So there are a couple already on built, um, really beautiful high angular resolution SC measurements. So there's Mustang 2 um, in, on Green Bank, and there's Toltec, which is being commissioned right now. And then there's Nika 2, where Florian can tell you all about that. So those are sort of Alma for very um, small field of view. They're not really survey instruments right now, so you can follow things up. So for discovering the highest reach of ones, that might be tricky. Um, at last is an ESA proposed huge telescope, 50 meters, um, which would be phenomenal. Um, and Alina Segal has also run a bunch of forecasts for something called CMBHD, which could be a successor to CMBS4 in the future, future decades. Um, but it would certainly help you. You win hard with resolution, um, not only for clusters, because clusters are still somewhat extended, but if you're really interested in dusty sources, um, your confusion limit obviously gets better if you have better angular resolution. How much data are we talking about and how do you get it from the South Pole? Data? Oh God. Oh man, Sasha knows. Um, so, okay, so I can tell you how we get it here. I can't remember, I, I'll be honest, I don't remember. It's, you know, 15,000 bolometers at 100 something Hertz for 60% of the day. It's the data we're talking about. I can't translate that off the top of my head into petabytes or terror. But where it comes from is we actually use the NASA Tedris system. Um, so they do allocate some bandwidth for the South Pole. Um, it's getting tight because BICEP and IceQ also transfer a bunch of data. Um, but right now, we are keeping up with our data rate to get everything back in the north. Um, the thing is, we do have enough hard drives down at the South Pole, and we do fly back our hard drives as well every year. Um, so for expansions for like CMBS4, that's a real problem. Um, Amy Bender, who's actually made this plot, is thinking a lot about those infrastructure logistics. Because um, you can't just string a fiber. It's got to be, if you want real-time data, it, it has to come over some satellite systems. OK, well, I think we're at wine and cheese time. <laughs> so thanks, everyone.